Maryland. Madam President, during his State of the Union address last week, President Biden once again rightly pointed out that Israel has the right, and I would say the duty, to defend itself in the aftermath of the brutal Hamas terror attack of October 7th that left approximately 1,200 brutally murdered and 240 taken hostage. There must be no more October 7th. President Biden also described the ongoing humanitarian disaster taking place in Gaza today. Over 31,000 Palestinians have been killed, over two-thirds of them women and children, likely thousands more unaccounted for, buried beneath the rubble. Gaza has become a hellhole of human suffering. Humanitarian organizations that have operated worldwide for decades say they have never witnessed a more terrible situation. Madam President, among those suffering in Gaza are not only over two million innocent Palestinian civilians, but also over 130 hostages still held by Hamas, including Americans. Earlier this week, I met with some of the families of Israeli hostages whose loved ones were kidnapped and are still being held captive, as well as one brave woman who was held hostage and released during the November pause. Every day that they are separated from their loved ones, not knowing what will happen to them next, is a day of unimaginable mental anguish and torment. That's why we must prioritize the release of the hostages and end the suffering of Palestinian civilians. And the only way to do that is to secure an immediate ceasefire and release all of the remaining hostages. That must happen. But until it happens, we must do everything in our power to protect innocent civilians and end the humanitarian disaster in Gaza. Today, four out of five of the hungriest people on Earth are in Gaza. Hundreds of thousands of them are on the verge of starvation. And over 23 children have crossed that grisly threshold and have died of starvation. Cindy McCain, the director of the World Food Program, has warned of an imminent famine. Injured, injured children are having their limbs amputated without anesthesia. Sewage is spilling onto the streets, and humanitarian officials are seeing spikes in the spread of various preventable diseases, like diarrhea among children. Mr. President, two weeks ago, the world got a glimpse of a horrible scene. Over 100 starving Palestinians were killed as they reached for food from trucks. In the aftermath of that horrible event, President Biden has ordered airdrops of food supplies. I support that decision because when people are starving, every parcel of food counts. But airdrops are just a drop in the ocean of need. So I was also glad to see the President order the building of a temporary port to help deliver more aid by ship. But that port will likely not be ready for at least 60 days. And even then, it will not be sufficient to meet the humanitarian need. All of these extraordinary efforts to deliver aid by air, by sea, are being undertaken when we know that during the pre-war period, when there was already a near blockade of Gaza, about 500 trucks still crossed daily through the Karem Shalom crossing into Gaza. And those 500 trucks crossed every day when the need was far less acute than it is right now. So the obvious question is why? Why in the world should we have to resort to these extraordinary and more expensive means to deliver insufficient amounts of food and aid by air and sea when we could bring in sufficient amounts of food and aid by truck much more efficiently through Egypt's Rafah crossing and the multiple crossing points into Gaza from Israel? And the answer is because this is a man-made disaster. The starvation in Gaza is not the result of food scarcity caused by drought or other natural disasters that we see in many parts of the world. 
This has been caused primarily because the Netanyahu government has used a series of tactics to restrict the amount of aid entering into Gaza. Anyone with eyes to see or ears to hear knows that. Members of the Netanyahu government, like Smotrich and Ben Gavir, have made no secret of their intentions. In October, after the war began, Ben Gavir said, quote, so long as Hamas does not release the hostages, the only thing that should enter Gaza is hundreds of tons of Air Force explosives, not one ounce of humanitarian aid. Smotrich uses power as finance minister to block a shipment of flour that could feed 1.1 million people for a month in Gaza. The shipment was finally released two days ago after having been blocked for five weeks at least, all while people were starving. And at one point, Prime Minister Netanyahu said his government was allowing just the, quote, minimum amount needed. And that was at a time when he and others denied that there was even a humanitarian disaster in Gaza, denied that there was a scarcity of food in Gaza, denied that there was hunger in Gaza. Mr. President, this is why President Biden has called out those restrictions and why, why he said in his State of the Union address that, quote, humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip, unquote. The president said that his administration is going to, quote, insist that Israel facilitate more trucks and more routes to get more and more people the help they need, no excuses, unquote. More than five weeks ago, on February 2nd, 25 senators sent a letter to President Biden calling for the Netanyahu government to implement five specific actions to sp significantly increase the amount of humanitarian aid entering Gaza. To date, none of them have been fully implemented. That is why many of us have called on President Biden to immediately invoke and implement the Humanitarian Aid Quarters Act, which is Section 620I of the Foreign Assistance Act. And now that NSM, National Security Memorandum 20, is in place, which is based on an amendment that 19 of us proposed to the National Security Act, it is essential essential that the Biden administration enforce its terms to get humanitarian aid delivered where it needs to go. When people are starving, patience is not a virtue. It needs to be said, Mr. President, that getting humanitarian aid into Gaza is only half the battle. The other half, and the more dangerous half, is distributing the aid once it is inside of Gaza. It doesn't do any good if you can't safely transport the food to the people who are starving. In other words, you need a safe distribution food for a distribution system for aid inside Gaza. Now, the organization that is prime, the primary distributor of assistance within Gaza has been an entity called the United Nations Relief Works Agency or known by, the, by its shorthand, UNRWA. Americans may have not heard much about UNRWA. So I want to say a little bit about why UNRWA exists and what it does in Gaza and elsewhere. But before I do that, I want to jump to why this is a pressing issue right now. The future of UNRWA is an urgent matter right now because Prime Minister Netanyahu and his extreme right-wing allies want to get rid of it, not just in Gaza, but everywhere that it operates. And guess what? Prime Minister Netanyahu and folks on the far right in his government have wanted to abolish UNRWA, not just since October 7th, but since at least 2017. In fact, in 2018, Prime Minister Netanyahu actually changed official Israeli policy with respect to UNRWA, saying that they wanted to cut off all funding to UNRWA, even at a time that his security team 
warned that it cr could create instabilities throughout the region if that happened. And now, Mr. President, we have members, Republican members of the House and the Senate who are jumping on this bandwagon and saying they want to abolish UNRWA. And how do they want to do this? By inserting a provision in the State Foreign Operations and Related Programs Appro Appropriations Bill, which is being considered and debated right now as we gather here to cut off all U.S. funding for UNRWA. That's what they want to do. So, Mr. President, let's go back to why UNRWA was created in the first place. In 1949, a year after the establishment of the State of Israel, the United Nations formed a new agency to provide vital services for over 700,000 Palestinian refugees who were displaced during the first Arab-Israeli war. Back then, the idea was that UNRWA would provide services to Palestinian refugees until a just and durable solution to their plight was found. As we know all too well, over 73 years have passed without a resolution to that conflict, which is why UNRWA's mission remains essential. Among other services, UNRWA provides schools and primary health services to Palestinian refugees and their descendants in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, the West Bank, and in Gaza. Mr. President, I hope we all agree that the Palestinian people deserve to live in dignity. And the way to do that is to ensure that they also have self-determination -determ in a homeland of their own. Just like every Israeli deserves dignity and self-determination in the Jewish and democratic state of Israel. President Biden and I and many others believe that the only viable long-term solution to this conflict is a two-state solution. And President Biden has put that idea forward as the best way to create some light at the end of this very dark tunnel. UNRWA was really intended to be a bridge until such a resolution was reached. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu has stated very clearly that he's opposed to a two-state solution. He was opposed to the Oslo Accords, and he has been a, a severe opponent of the two-state solution. And as I said earlier, he also wants to eliminate UNRWA, which today is an organization of over 300,000 employees providing services to Palestinians in three countries, and as I said, also in the West Bank and Gaza. 13,000 of those 30,000 UNRWA staff operate in Gaza, many of them as teachers. Since the war started with the brutal Hamas attacks on Israel of October 7th, UNRWA schools in Gaza have shut down. And as a United Nations agency, it has deployed its resources to supply humanitarian relief to the civilian population there. It is the main vehicle for distributing humanitarian assistance in Gaza. It won't do any good to get humanitarian assistance into Gaza if you dismantle the UN organization principally responsible for delivering that aid to people in Gaza. This morning I met with Chef Jose Andres, and I applaud him for his efforts and the efforts of the World Central Kitchen around the world, including in Israel and in Gaza. He said, and I quote, support for UNRWA is vital. If you want to feed people, you need to support UNRWA. We may have a temporary port, but when the ship gets to the port, someone has to transfer that food and other assistance from the ship to the people who need it in Gaza. And UNRWA is the principal distributor of assistance. And you talk to the World Food Program and others, they say very clearly they cannot replace that capacity that UNRWA has. Now, Mr. President, in late January,
The Netanyahu government alleged that up to 14 of UNRWA's 13,000 employees participated in the horrific October attacks against Israel. These are, of course, very serious allegations, and UNRWA has taken them seriously. All agree that any individuals involved in that horror must be held accountable. And even though the Netanyahu government has not provided UNRWA with the underlying evidence, UNRWA immediately fired the alleged perpetrators. The UN Secretary General also took swift action and announced the launch of a full and independent investigation led by the UN's highest investigative body into the allegations. And that is ongoing. At the same time, President Biden suspended all U.S. contributions to UNRWA pending the outcome of that investigation. A number of other countries followed suit, as did the EU. But, Mr. President, since then, two things have changed. First, the Netanyahu government has not shared the underlying evidence with UNRWA, nor, as reported by the Wall Street Journal, has it shared the raw evidence with the United States. In fact, I urge every one of my Senate colleagues to read the, classi the classified report prepared by the DNI. And I especially urge my colleagues to read the intelligence assessments about the many other claims the Netanyahu government has made against UNRWA. And there have been many. I am sure that many of my colleagues are unaware of the fact that UNRWA has long provided both Israel and the United States with the names and identities of all its employees for full review and vetting. Now, Israel, of course, has far more extensive intelligence capabilities than UNRWA, but apparently they have never previously raised complaints about any of the UNRWA employees on the lists given to them. Second, Mr. President, the EU and many countries that initially suspended their financial support for UNRWA have since restored their contributions because they have acknowledged the desperation in Gaza and the irreplaceable nature of UNRWA. In fact, even prior to these allegations, UNRWA had asked the UN Secretary General to convene an independent review group to assess whether UNRWA is doing everything within its power to ensure neutrality. So again, UNRWA in Gaza is an organization with a staff of 13,000 people that is delivering essential life-sustaining aid to over 2 million people. And what the EU and these other countries that have restored UNRWA funding recognize that it is inhumane to cut off assistance to 2 million people because of the atrocious alleged acts of 14. Punish the 14. Don't punish 2 million innocent Gazans. And that is why I believe that President Biden should restore this assistance now. Now, Mr. President, the notion that UNRWA is somehow a front group for Hamas is a total lie, pure and simple. The individual dispatched by President Biden to be the U.S. humanitarian coordinator in the region is a veteran diplomat. Ambassador David Satterfield. He has repeatedly debunked claims made by members of the Netanyahu government that humanitarian aid provided by UNRWA has been diverted to Hamas. Specifically, he said the following, and I quote, I have not received any allegations, evidence, or reports of any incidents of Hamas diversion or theft of U.S. or other assistance or fuel from UN-delivered assistance from any of our partners or from the government of Israel since the humanitarian assistance resumed in Gaza October 21st. Not a single report from Israeli government officials or anybody else about Hamas diverting aid that was being transported by UNRWA 
or other UN agencies. My colleagues, you should all know that the individual overseeing operations on the ground in Gaza today is an American named Scott Anderson. He is a 21-year Army veteran from South Dakota. He is a no-nonsense guy. I urge every senator to talk to him. The notion that Scott Anderson is part of a front organization for Hamas is patently absurd. The truth is that before the war started, Prime Minister Netanyahu did not pretend that he wanted to dismantle UNRWA on the grounds that it was a proxy for Hamas. He has long wanted to eliminate UNRWA, not only in Gaza, but everywhere else that it supports education for Palestinian school children and health care for Palestinians, like in the West Bank and Jordan. As he said, as I said, he's been trying to do that since at least the year 2017. And now he has Republicans in Congress joining him in calling for the defunding of all U.S. support for UNRWA, not only in Gaza, but throughout the region. Attempts to discredit UNRWA and the UN have gotten so bad that 18 heads of all major UN humanitarian and refugee agencies, together with NGOs like Save the Children and Care, signed a statement calling for a, quote, halt to the campaigns that seek to discredit the United Nations and non-governmental organizations doing their best to save lives, unquote. It is making it harder for them to save lives. Mr. President, if you want to take a combustible situation in the West Bank and make it even worse, then close down schools for kids there. Take away any chance of an education. Snuff out any hopes they may have for a brighter future. Really? If you want to create instability in Jordan, shut down UNRWA schools and services there. Why do we all think that King Abdullah has warned us about the consequences of shutting down UNRWA? And here's the crazy thing about this moment. Prime Minister Netanyahu has seized on the lies about UNRWA being a proxy for Hamas in Gaza to achieve his long-term goal of shutting down UNRWA everywhere. And what adds insult to injury, Mr. President, is that UNRWA has not perpetuated Hamas in Gaza, but Prime Minister Netanyahu himself has done exactly that. Let me explain. You know, there's a lot of talk here in the United States Senate about the malign actions that have, actors who have supported Hamas over the years. One of them is a very malign actor, Iran. Now, Iran did not create Hamas, nor does Iran exercise command and control over Hamas, but it does support Hamas because, like Iran, Hamas has the despicable goal of eliminating Israel. That's why Iran has supported Hamas. But what we rarely, if ever, discuss is the inconvenient truth that until the unexpected horror of the Hamas attack on October 7th, Prime Minister Netanyahu himself saw it as in his interest to keep Hamas in control in Gaza. Don't take my word for it. He told us in his own words back in 2019 at a Likud party meeting where he said, and I quote, anyone who wants to prevent the creation of a Palestinian state needs to support strengthening Hamas. This is part of our strategy to divide the Palestinians between those in Gaza and those in Judea and Samaria, unquote. Prime Minister Netanyahu, anyone who wants to prevent the creation of a Palestinian state needs to support strengthening Hamas. Mr. President, I'd like to enter into the record a piece that appeared in Haaretz in October of last year, entitled A Brief History of the Netanyahu Hamas Alliance.
I ask unanimous consent that it be entered in the record. Without objection. After all, so long as Hamas was in control in Gaza, how could anyone ask Israel to accept a Palestinian state that included Gaza and the West Bank? It's a fair question. So what are some of the ways in which Prime Minister Netanyahu has enabled Hamas to maintain its control in Gaza? Well, another thing we've heard a lot about around here is the money from Qatar that went to Hamas. It is well established that every penny of that money flowed from Qatar to Hamas with the concurrence of Prime Minister Netanyahu and Israel. That has been the testimony of witnesses in both the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee. It has also been well documented in numerous news sources. Mr. President, I'd like to enter into the record a CNN article entitled, quote, Qatar sent millions to Gaza for years, dash, with Israel's backing, unquote. I ask unanimous consent that be entered into the record. Without objection. And, Mr. President, I'd also like to enter into the record a New York Times article from December of last year entitled, and I quote, Buying Quiet Inside the Israeli Plan That Propped Up Hamas. Subheadline, quote, Prime Minister Netanyahu gambled that a strong Hamas, in parentheses, but not too strong, would keep the peace and reduce pressure for a Palestinian state. Without objection. But, Mr. President, Prime Minister Netanyahu's role in keeping Hamas in control in Gaza did not end there. Mr. President, I would like to enter into the record a New York Times piece, again from December of last year, headlined, and I quote, Israel found the Hamas money machine years ago. Nobody turned it off, unquote. Without objection. And I want to quote from Mr. Levy, who is quoted in that article. He was the Mossad chief in charge of economic policy, who says, and I quote, I can tell you for sure that I talked to him, referring to Prime Minister Netanyahu, about this, but he didn't care that much about it, unquote. The article goes on to point out that Mr. Netanyahu's Mossad chief shut down Mr. Levy's team, the task force called Harpoon, that focused on disrupting the money flowing to groups, including Hamas. So, Mr. President, let's go back to why Prime Minister Netanyahu and his extreme right-wing allies, like Smotrich and Ben Gavir, wanted to keep Hamas in place in Gaza. It's because, as they've said, their primary goal was to avoid the establishment of a Palestinian state. And so long as they could keep the Palestinians divided, they could avoid a united national movement for such a state. And as so long as Hamas was in control in Gaza, it proved a useful foil against recognizing a Palestinian state that included the West Bank and Gaza until the horror of October 7th. Now, the corollary to not threatening Hamas's control of Gaza has been to systematically weaken the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. The terrible irony, of course, is that while helping perpetuate Hamas, which was dedicated to the destruction of Israel and is dedicated to the destruction of Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu and his allies have undermined the Palestinian Authority and the PLO, which for over 30 years since the Oslo Accords have recognized Israel's right to exist and have sought to coexist with Israel. Their strategy, keep Hamas in place, undermine the Palestinian Authority. In fact, even today, during the war in Gaza, Finance Minister Smotrich is withholding an even greater share of the PA's own funds. And since coming to power, the Netanyahu government has advanced even more settlements and allowed even more outposts deeper in the West Bank. And of course, that further undermines the legitimacy of the PA in the eyes of the Palestinian people by exposing their total inability to stop those actions. Even as they, the PA, help provide 
Israel with security in certain areas of the West Bank. So Prime Minister Netanyahu has advanced this strategy, weakening the Palestinian Authority and facilitating Hamas in order to prevent Palestinians from being able to live in dignity in a state of their own. And the reason, the reason Prime Minister Netanyahu and the far-right extremists in his government, like Smotrich and Ben Gavir, don't want a Palestinian state in the West Bank, is that they want it all for themselves in what they envision as a greater Israel. If you have Palestinians in the West Bank or a state in the West Bank, you can't implement the vision of a greater Israel, their version of one state. So, Mr. President, we come full circle. UNRWA was established to be a bridge to provide services like education, to Palestinian refugees after they were displaced. And I am sure its founders did not expect it to be around for so long. But that is because they likely never envisioned that 74 years later, the conflict that gave rise to UNRWA would remain unresolved. But it is unresolved. And now Prime Minister Netanyahu has openly opposed President Biden's call to resolve it ultimately by enacting a real two-state solution that would include normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia and the other Arab countries who have yet to recognize Israel. Important security needed for the Jewish state of Israel. And at the same time that Prime Minister Netanyahu wants to torpedo a two-state solution to resolve the conflict, he also wants to pursue his long-term goal of ending the organization that was born out of that conflict. UNRWA, and eliminating the services that it currently provides to Palestinian refugees. Mr. President, the United States should not be complicit in this scheme. We should not be a party to defunding UNRWA in Gaza, which is right now playing a critical role in the delivery of desperately needed food and humanitarian assistance to starving people. Nor should we be complicit in defunding the essential services UNRWA provides in places like the West Bank and Jordan and other places. I support reforming UNRWA, but not eliminating it. The question of defunding UNRWA is at this very moment the biggest unresolved issue in the Foreign Operations Appropriations Bill. I call upon responsible members of Congress in the Senate and the House to ensure that the United States does not defund UNRWA. Members of Congress who argue for the elimination of UNRWA have never bothered to drive a short distance from Jerusalem to, vi to visit an UNRWA school and hear young students talk about their dreams to be doctors, engineers, and educators, like some of us have done. There is hope in these schools, not hate. And frankly, that's what we should be able to do here in the United States Senate. We should be on the side of hope. We should not be a party to more people starving in Gaza. We should not be a party to the closing of schools for Palestinian students in the West Bank, Jordan, and other countries. And the United States should not be a party to creating even more instability in the Middle East. Mr. President, like many of my colleagues and like President Biden, I believe the only way to create some light at the end of this dark tunnel is to find a path that ensures security for the Israeli people and dignity and self-determination for the Palestinian people. That is why I stand with our colleague Senator Schumer and his important and timely comments this morning that rejecting the idea of Palestinian statehood and sovereignty is a, quote, grave mistake, unquote, for regional security and especially for the security of Israelis and Palestinians. Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that a two-state solution would be a big reward, reward, he says, for Hamas. But the opposite is true. Hamas has one plan, the destruction of the state of Israel and replacing the Jewish democratic state with one of their own. They want one state. 
A two-state solution is contrary to everything Hamas stands for and all it seeks to achieve. So far from being a reward, it would be a denial of their goal of one state under Hamas control. We all know that the road ahead will be long and it will be hard. In the aftermath of the horrific Hamas attacks of October 7th and the current humanitarian disaster in Gaza, it is hard to imagine a time of peace and stability. That will only come when Palestinian leaders who fully embrace the right of Israel to exist in security and Israeli leaders who recognize that Palestinians must have a viable state of their own both make the necessary risks for peace. So, Mr. President, let us push for an immediate ceasefire and a release of all the hostages, and then let us create a flicker of hope in this moment of darkness. I yield the floor.